2014. Uh, welcome to the February 11th, 2014 meeting of the Pequannock Township Council. Mr. Delaney, can you read the statement of compliance with the Open Public Meetings Act? Pursuant to the requirements of New Jersey's Open Public Meetings Act, notice of this meeting was included in the annual meeting notice, which has been filed in the office of the Township Clerk, posted on the bulletin board here in the Municipal Building, posted on the Township website, and uh, published as a legal notice in the Suburban Trends newspaper. Notice has also been provided to those requesting notice and, and making payment in accordance with Township policy. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a prayer and a moment of thanks for individuals serving our nation. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Most gracious Providence, we ask that you bless this governing body with an abundance of wisdom and understanding so that every deliberation will result in actions which will, pro which, which will promote the common good and general welfare of all the people of Pequannock Township. Amen. Amen. All right, Jay, will you call uh, roll call? Mr. Cole? Yeah. Here. Mr. Phelan? Here. Mr. Vanderhoff? Here. Ms. Winterfield? Here. Mayor Florence Lynch? Here. Okay. Um, first item on the agenda is uh, presentations. I guess we don't have, do we have any presentations tonight? We do not. Okay. Uh, now we'll go to reports from volunteers. At this time, are there reports or comments from the volunteers? I understand uh, Ed and uh, Jay have a presentation from the Historic District Commission. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I am Jay Wanzik, uh, Chairman of the Historic District Preservation Commission. And uh, tonight, uh, in addition to myself, we have uh, Township Historian and Member Ed Engelbart, Lou A. Bear, Robert Safarik, Anita, and uh, Dave Wisniewski. Um, first, I'd just like to uh, thank Council for the opportunity to be here tonight and also thank you for uh, all of the previous support you've had. Uh, to that effort, we're very proud of, of the efforts we've made with the Town Museum over the past several years. And uh, as evidence of that is the Pathways of History book that the uh, collective uh, township and municipal and private museums in Northeast Morris County issued this past fall. And I don't know if all of you have a copy of that, but our, our township museum is featured in there, as well as a number of other museums in the Northeast part of the county. Tonight we're here on, on a fairly important matter, and that is the uh, future of the Martin Berry House. Uh, the Martin Berry House uh, was the first historic home put on the National Historic Register uh, in the early 1970s in the township. It is perhaps uh, the oldest or one of the two oldest uh, homes in the township dating back to perhaps 1720. The only house that may be the same age or older is the rear or original portion of the Van Gelder Van Sohn home. Uh, historic preservation is a multifaceted uh, topic and there are a number of different ways to preserve um, buildings. Very often the opportunity to preserve that occurs when a property changes hands. Usually owners who love their historic homes <coughs> postpone uh, the preservation process or, or beginning discussions on that until the last minute. They want to hold on as long as possible and then either age or health or, or a desire to move and be with family uh, suddenly trumps all of those other decisions and then it's, uh, oh, I'm, I want to move soon. And that's the case with most historic uh, homes and it's the case with the Martin Berry House. Uh, the present owner um, now wa wants to move on. She's uh, quite advanced in age and um, she wants to be with her family. Um, as I noted, this was the oldest home put on the National Historic Register. However, the federal government in 1939 uh, recognized the significance of the home and is one of only two homes that the federal government actually documented in 1939 in the township. Uh, besides the Martin Ferry House was the Garrett Vaness House, which stood across the tracks behind the municipal building on a hill where the current uh, village is today. That home was already in significant disrepair and uh, roofs caving in and whatever, and that was documented. Um, 
the Martin Berry House was empty in 1939 as well when, when, when the federal uh, uh, people came in to document it. Today, you can find on the web over 20 pages of photographs and drawings of the home. And uh, for those uh, who are unfamiliar with it, I have extra copies here in the audience. Let me just distribute this to you now. Again, for those who are unaware where the Martin Berry House, it's situated uh, between the end of Cedar Road and Route 23, just north of uh, Stefano's Restaurant or uh, where the Hobby Hut used to be. It's a heavily wooded lot, and you cannot really see the home clearly anymore from Route 23. It has access both off 23 and Cedar Road. To get into some of the specifics now of... Uh, the value of the presentation of the home, as well as some of the ideas that we have uh, to make it a going project and a sustainable project in the future. I'm going to now call on uh, Ed Engelbart, our town historian. Thank you, Jay. Ed Engelbart, town historian, uh, 64 Upper Avenue, Palm Tree Plains. Safer over there, Ed. But on the other hand, uh, I want to again like uh, thank all of you for the support the of the Historic District Commission and our activities that are taking place at the Pumpkin Plain Railroad Station. Um, one of the things that um, um, I'll be doing is passing out some material to you. In fact, uh, let me do that right now. Um, so, uh, take a look at it. Um, I'll be happy to take a look at it. I don't know how many of you have been over to the Martin Berry House, but if you go to Route 23, uh, you'll see a historic sign there. That historic sign, if you've ever read it, says this, or if you haven't read it, Martin Berry House, built by the Martin Berry by Martin Berry, 1693 uh, to 1784, son of the first family to settle Compton Plains. Only pre-revolutionary building of substantially unaltered Inquiry County. Now that sign, I have a picture of, of it, which is um, from a newspaper that was in 1977. Nothing has changed since that time was put up. So what we're talking about is probably the oldest uh, home in our community, the oldest unaltered community uh, home. If you were to go into that house today, it's like a time wall. It's like going back into the 1700s. Little or nothing has changed. It is presently owned by uh, Eleanor Bogart. She and her husband, um, Charles Bogart, who was now deceased for a number of years, uh, really saved that home. Uh, originally, that site was going to be, uh, or was designated commercial. And it would have become one of those 1950s, 60s types of strip mall stores. They decided they, to save it. It is under national and state registry. It is a, a house, as I said, that is um, like going back into the 1700s. And to lose it would be a, a tragedy. Um, the Borgats have been there since the 1950s. Uh, she is the 12th owner of that house. What's also rather interesting in terms of um, this house, um, the Berry family, um, in fact, one of the Berries, by the name of uh, Samuel Berry, was one of the original purchases of the land that was Pequannock Township. Uh, today, Pequannock is only about seven, a little over seven square miles. At one time, it was 176 square miles. Uh, we used to go up to Lake Opatcon. This is a remnant that has survived um, from that very, very early period. Originally, the property uh, was 54 acres. Uh, today, it's, um, uh, I believe, Dave, what was the acreage? About two. 
about a little over two acres. That's all it is. In fact, what's rather interesting, uh, the town has recently made some money over that, off that house. Okay? Uh, recently, one piece of property, uh, which was a farmhouse, was turned over to the Habitat for Humanities. It was fixed up. A family is living it. Taxes are now being paid on that piece of property. Also, another small piece of property. These pieces actually were subdivided over 30 years ago. And now you have money coming in from two remnant pieces. What we're interested in is saving the existing house with the land around it. That other house was recently bought, um, or I should say the other piece of property was bought by a man by the name of DeHart, who has built a house on it, and that is generating uh, tax revenue uh, for the township as well. In the case of the Martin Berry House, um, you have the Berry family connected with the origins of this town going back to 1695-1696. In the case of the Martin Berry House, you also have another connection. Uh, in the cemetery of the First Reformed Church, there's a man by the name of James R. Evans. He was the station agent of... Um, of the uh, Potton Plains Station. He owned that house at one time. When he received his Medal of Honor for service in the Civil War, he was living in that house with his family at, the, at that time. So there is another connection with another noted uh, individual. Uh, in the case of, of Evans, uh, he also played a role in the history of this town's government. Uh, he was postmaster of the Potton Plains Post Office. He owned the Martin, he owned what originally was the Martin Berry store, which today we call Jones's Hardware. In addition, he was a justice of the peace. He was also a constable, which was the old term for a policeman in town, and he was a school board member uh, of the Potton Plains School, which uh, used to exist, where you have the Pont and Plains Post Office today. It, it's a place that we are trying to, uh, to save because of these reasons. And as Jay said, uh, one of the important things is the Library of Congress, back in the 30s, felt this house was so important <coughs> that they sent a team of engineers and architects to do a study and a survey and photograph um, that particular house because they felt it was so important in order to save for future generations. The other thing that um, you will find on the documentation I gave you, uh, you'll notice where it says future uses of the Martin Berry House and the reasons. This is on uh, page uh, three of the documentation, and I have listed here a number of ways that this house can be utilized. I won't go into all of them, but as you know, we do have the uh, Potton Plains Railroad Station, and we're thankful for that, okay, that it was uh, bought by the town, restored, but it has become so successful in, ter in terms of getting material donated, okay, because we have a physical place, we are out of room. Um, if we want to put something on the walls, we've got to come up with new frames and new material and replace it with what's, uh, and, and take down what was there. So that's one of the things that, that we face. We also um, have really little room, or actually really no room anymore, for physical things. And we need a location uh, for that. So uh, can I stop you for yes. a second? What would we do with the train station if we have a... Okay, the, uh, the train station would still be held on. However, much of it would be devoted to a railroadian uh, uh, focus. Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, what's rather interesting, I don't know whether Jay had mentioned this, this April, um, a Erie Railroad group, okay, uh, this is the Erie, Erie Lackawanna Historical Society. They're coming into town uh, this April, and they're going to be having their meeting, which normally was in Parsippany. It's going to be at the Best Western Hotel in town. That's where it's going to be in, in April. And we're hoping to open up the railroad station 
and have a, a lot more material on railroading history with the Pump and Plain Station and the New York Susquehanna and Weston, the Montclair and the Erie, which uh, was one time uh, the owner of the station. And at one time, um, the Erie had a 999-year contract uh, to run the line. Let me know how that works out after, uh, I guess it'll be a little bit less than 900 maybe 80 years now, something like that. Ed, so, Ed, so would the historic committee man both places? Uh, what we are focusing on, over the years, we have uh, tried to get going what we call a Pequannock Historic Society. Right now, the focus is on the people who are part of the Historic District Commission, which are appointed by the town council. We actually have lists of people who want to participate in town history. And what we want to do is create a Friends of Pequannock History and the Martin Berry House and get a core group of people, and we know they're out there, and then have the Martin Berry House as the focus of that group, and then use the Martin Berry House as an archives. Right now, we're using the library. It would free up room in the library. We also know that at the bottom of the Martin Berry House, you can extend that into a meeting room type of, of, of uh, setting. And that could be a, a place for, for lectures. It would be possible to free up space at the library so that the library could um, utilize more of their facility um, rather than have, for example, right now we have what we call a history room or quiet room in, in the library. And that would be freed up. And we would shift that over to um, the Martin Berry House. Did you get an estimate on this house yet? Excuse me? Did we get an estimate? Well, an estimate? that's the first on? thing. If you look toward the back page. Oh, I didn't get to the back page. That's okay. Um, you'll see using the Pequannock Open Space Trust Fund and the Morris County Open Space Fund and the Morris County Historic Preservation Trust Fund to purchase and restore the Martin Berry House. Uh, what would happen is the first thing we are asking you to do is to provide some money for a, uh, an appraiser, okay, to appraise the house. We will then go to uh, Mrs. Bogart, who is 93 years of age, God bless her, we should all live that long and have the uh, skills and ability that she still has. Today. Ed, Ed, I have a yes. question for you. What kind of condition, I haven't seen it in years, okay. what kind of condition um, is that house in now, and what would be the plan the to keep maintaining it? The house does require work, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the first step would be an appraisal. Negotiate with Mrs. Uh, 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 Bogart, come up with a figure, um, and then submit that figure to the Morris County Open Space Trust, okay? We don't know what they would give, but given the nature of this particular house, okay, and its history, um, I cannot see how they, they would uh, oppose it. There are a number of towns, for example, that have more than two, that has two or more sites that they take care of uh, within their uh, uh, purview. Uh, the town of Wayne, even though it's much, much larger, actually has two homes. Okay, the Van Riper Hopper House, as well as the Schuyler Colfax House. And there's uh, other communities that have the same thing. So when would you need the money for the appraisal? As soon as we can get it. So it would have to go on our agenda next meeting Correct. for us to right. have a discussion and then go through that whole Right. Thing. I'm sure the council... And then I've spoken to, uh, to Dave about this, and we do have a way of getting an appraiser. Uh, we have a connection with the uh, New Jersey... Um, uh, land yeah. Conservancy. Right, but the, the, the appraisal is not going to be that much money. No, not the cost dollars. of it isn't going to be right. Much. right, right. That's the first step. Right, it's the then negotiating step that's right. going to get the And then space. going to the it's Open Space money. Trust. Yeah. I've spoken to people from uh, the Open Space Trust on this, mm -hmm. and they told me that there is a kind of um, window that we have to meet, which would be sometime in June. Okay. We, we have tied up some of our Open Space money temporarily looking at a piece of property on the other side of town. I know that. Okay, just so you're aware. Okay. The, the idea is we'll try to get as much as we can. No, there I, might have to be a, a contribution from our own open space trust, but that remains to be seen as to what are the requirements of the uh, uh, 
Morris County Open Space Trust. Right. I mean, again, I'm sure the council would be agreeable to doing the appraisal. Right. Um, let's just, just start going down the path and see what happens. <coughs> That's it. Yeah. It's it's really taking it one step at a time. Yeah, I mean, it sounds very, you know, it sounds like a very interesting concept and something right. to explore. It's just, you know, what's how much money is it going to be? How are we going right. to maintain it over time? Now, um, with regard to restoring it the way we did with the railroad station, yeah. you then make application to the Morris County Historic Preservation Trust Fund. And that's on an 80-20 basis. Okay, uh, they supply 80%. Um, the town has to come up with uh, 20% for the restoration. And the first thing that has to be done is you get somebody, like the way we do with the railroad station, by the name of Tom Fenneman, and we don't know who that would be, and you, you uh, ask for money for a preservation plan uh, from the uh, preservation board at the county. And then um, that becomes the basis uh, for what has to be done at the uh, house in order to restore it. And once you go through that process, you'll get the house up to um, uh, quality standards. And you should be okay for at least 10 years, okay? On the other hand, the town does have to buy into issues that might, might come up with some uh, issue with an, um, a plumbing issue or electrical issue, but you can deal with um, things such as uh, uh, upgrading septic system, electrical systems, that would all be part of the, uh, the preservation plan. And I, ha yeah. I have two questions. Uh, one is, I'm not sure how on council who's been in the house. I mean, I had the pleasure of spending three hours with Eleanor. Mm -hmm. And the house is very amazing. So I don't know if there's a way to arrange for council. We can do that. To have I'll a field trip. I'll speak to uh, Eleanor Bogut. And then if you want to have a, uh, a, a council visitation. Because you really should see what you're but getting yourself I into. I think that's very important. I haven't been here in 30, 40 years. So. Yeah. We'll do it separate times. Jay? No, I'm sure we can <laughs> figure it out. see if the house needs. Well, uh, it's going to need a roof. It's okay, <laughs> it's going to need some drainage issues. Okay, we have to see what the septic system is. Okay, I don't. Things would have to probably be, likely be brought up to code, just as we did with the railroad station. You, you know, your electrical would have to be gone over and make sure that's the code. Your plumbing, whatever, uh, handicap accessible bathroom. Luckily, this house is virtually accessible on two floors. On the basement is is a ground level. And the uh, the front of the house is near ground level. That a small ramp would, would suffice. Uh, one thing I did want to bring up is that uh, we started the process a few you know last week, gathering information to exactly how the municipalities who have more than one museum building manage those buildings. I've requested copies of the agreements from uh, at least two towns so far, and also uh, if. In fact, one of them, we believe, has a caretaker in there. What sort of agreement do they have? Because there's a lot of federal income tax considerations and how do you choose caretakers. Uh, we're exploring all of those options, but uh, as I said, there's, there's some uh, buildings, historic buildings in town, that are managed by the town, as we do with the railroad station. In some towns, one of their house museum is managed by a uh, historic society, such as Ed uh, was talking about the possibility of the Friends of the Martin Berry House, and in one town that I know of in Morris County, a local service organization uh, has a contract with the town to manage the museum. So we're trying to get copies of these agreements if we can as quickly as possible. And uh, as we get them in, or I'll put them in a package for uh, council sometime uh, towards the end of next week, so you have that to look at, mm -hmm. as the possibilities as, as how the, uh, uh, the uh, location of the Martin Berry House Museum would be managed. Are there others that are managed by a county historical society at all? Well, you do have the Morris County Historic Society. Uh, they have an 1853 Victorian mansion called mm -hmm. Acorn Hall. Um, and um, that society manages that house. It's also a repository for historic items on Morris County. Um, they have their own uh, full-time uh, staff, a, a director, mm -hmm. um, a part-time curator, and um, a, lot, a lot of volunteers. Mm -hmm. They also have arrangements with uh, various colleges and universities, and they bring in interns. And those interns are learning about uh, history and the management of a uh, historic home. Yeah. 
maybe they're worth a conversation or oh, some yeah, with them. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. yeah, definitely. It, my big concern, Ed, is the cost of this. I mean, as you start talking about repairing this and repairing that and putting yep. the roofs on and stuff, you've heard yes. the, the, the comment money pit yeah. just comes to mind mm -hmm. when you're talking here. Uh, yeah, but the, but the big problem is under current laws today, okay, somebody could buy that house, mm -hmm. neglect it, mm -hmm. and then what's going to happen is they will use that neglect to bulldoze it. That's what will happen. So the taxpayers should pay to keep it from being neglected, is what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is you have a house that's a historic house that has a long history with this community. This is a surviving remnant of what our town was like at its origins. And it's a decision of this council, and I think it's also a decision maybe of the taxpayers, okay, definitely, are they willing to support this initiative that's being presented by the Historic District Commission? Well, I think what we have to do is do the appraisal, and then we'll take it step by step and see what the actual cost that's, is. At this point, is. that's all we're asking. Right, and I think... You do it step by step. Right, I think that's the smart thing to do, right. because as we start to look at it and see what the cost is really going Correct. to be, and what's it going to cost to replace this, and what's the county going to give us, and oh, we have to kick 20% in, and so forth, et cetera. Correct. So we have to see what the big picture is, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, Correct. But we can start, in my opinion, with the appraisal. I mean, we're here tonight to, to ask plant the, 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 the plant, plant well, the, the original support is for an appraisal. Right. The thing is, though, that she is 93, Eleanor and uh, Bogart. So we can't wait three years. We really need no, to... No, let's put it on the agenda. I think, I think we're, we're all on the same page as far as exploring it. <coughs> well, well, exploring is, right, is one but, thing, but we really you know, need to get the appraisal done so we know what yeah, we're talking right. about with the county because they won't talk to us without an appraisal, right, obviously. But can we put this on a fast track somehow, Dave? Or? Well, sure. I mean, after the last meeting where uh, yeah, we had mm -hmm. floated the idea, um, you know, based on feedback, I, I really wanted to have Historic District mm -hmm. Commission come in and kind of give a, a more detailed uh, plan and overview for the home. Um, I, I really expected to have the uh, the, uh, the appraisals, uh, the estimates uh, for this evening. They didn't have all of them. You know, as we typically do, uh, Land Conservancy goes out and requests uh, proposals from mm -hmm. three different um, mm -hmm. you know, appraisers. Uh, they don't have all three. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know what these appraisals cost. They're, they, they, for single-family homes, they tend to be, uh, you know, in the eight, nine hundred dollar range. If you want mm -hmm. to approve it, we can, Let's you know, by, by motion, you can approve up to. I'll ask for twelve hundred, um, just to be on the safe side. All right. Mm -hmm. So I can make a motion to um, approve you getting an appraisal up to twelve hundred dollars. And as soon as we have the uh, the estimates in hand, we will award it to the lowest of the three uh, three quotes, and we'll do a confirming with the specifics uh, and the company name next time. But I mean, I can that will get us wrong. All right. So I made a motion. I'll second it. There you go. Roll. Melissa, Melissa, roll call. Yeah, Jay, do roll call on that. <coughs> this is Florence Lynch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 what? You did that backwards. Was <laughs> 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 that a joke? <laughs> well, that, yes. That's all right. Mr. Fayla. Mr. Vanderhoff. Oh, we got to make this a tie now. <laughs> yes. And Ms. Winterfield. Yes. That's fun. I'm sleeping over here. I have um, <laughs> one quick question. Once once you start using these trust funds like Open Space and right. to to fund this, are you allowed to do other things on top of it, whether it's getting... You know, whether it's a uh, fundraising by or the community, money, like whether it's money. other grants, whether it's volunteers that can come in and yeah, say, you know, we want to, you know, you might get a builder in town that says, I'll do the roof, you know. Well, I'm just wondering that, if that's something. I'm, I'm not sure. That might uh, pose uh, <laughs> an issue. Whatever the town, the municipal bid laws, the site bid laws. Right. Yeah, right. And, and the, uh, the requirement for... You know, if you get a grant in the historic district, you know, the Morris County Historic Preservation is a, an 80, 20, uh, you know, 20 goes to the local, but those funds don't have to be municipal tax dollars. Okay. If there were funds raised privately, mm -hmm. they could make up a portion or all of the 20%. And, those, and that 20%, you can get it from any source. 
Wherever Dave, you want it, you can get has that. The, has the county also freed up that June deadline? Have they done anything that they keep talking about? Not, not yet. They're still in the <coughs> process of doing their review. As a matter of fact, I have a, mm -hmm. uh, a, a sit-down interview on Thursday with their consultant okay. to go over um, you know, our particular mm -hmm. process and needs. and Because they have a lot of money and all the taxpayers locked up. So they really need yeah. to move that along. And uh, there are, what I've heard, there are several things that, that they would like to change in terms of uh, maybe broadening the scope of some of the things that they're allowed to use the money for, which Good. would allow them to, you know, use some of the existing money, change some of the filing deadlines so some of the programs are on a rolling basis rather than once a year. So are you meeting with other municipalities that. or is it a one-on-one? -on -one? It, it's one-on-one, -on -one, and this is a consultant that was hired by the county, by the mm -hmm. freeholders, to look at their open space and historic district funds and make recommendations. So there, you know, there's a, uh, a survey that uh, all the communities completed and they're going out and doing one-on-one -on -one interviews okay. with administrators, managers. I assume they're going to open space committees, okay. uh, elected officials, and they're, they're doing their fact-finding and information gathering. Okay. Is this uh, topic too late to add to our survey? I mean, th this, you know, these changes that might come in for the county might be advantageous with the other piece of property that you're, you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, so um, right now there's, there's a window of opportunity, and we're just asking you to consider that, and we thank you for your decision with regard to the uh, appraisal. Uh, appraisal. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ed. Right. Good job. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Um, are there any other uh, committee volunteer reports now? All right. Next item on our agenda is uh, public comment. This public comment period will be limited to a total of 30 minutes. An additional period for public comment is reserved for later in the meeting. Individuals are requested to limit their questions and comments to three minutes. If anyone wishes to address the council, please wait to be recognized to come to the microphone and provide your name and address for the record. Anyone? Okay. All right. I guess we're done with our public comment. <laughs> All right. Next on the agenda is our public hearings. We do have one public hearing on our agenda, correct? Let me just do it in my thing. Yes, Mayor, uh, this is a public hearing on ordinance number 2014-01, an ordinance authorizing the execution of a contract for the purchase of block 2306, lot 20, also known as 90 Village Road, from Richard Bertoli and Julie Bertoli. Uh, any comments on that from the council? Or I should say from the public. Open hearing. Open hearing. I'm on the wrong page here. I'm sorry. <laughs> if anyone in the audience has any questions or comments, um, please come to the microphone and identify yourself for the record. Anyone? Okay. Now I would make a motion to anyone? approve yeah. 2014-01. I'll second. All in favor? Oh, roll, oh, roll call. call. I'm sorry. Mr. Cole? This is today. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Caleb? Yes. Mr. Vanderhoff? Yes. Ms. Winterfield? Yes. Mayor Flores Lynch? Yes. All right, where are we now? Number nine. <coughs> okay. Um, now we're up to ordinances for introduction. Yes, and, Mr. Uh, Delaney? This is uh, ordinance number 2014. Dash zero two, a bond ordinance amending bond ordinance number 2010 22 of the Township of Klonic in the County of Mars, New Jersey, finally adopted November 23rd, 2010, in its entirety, which provides for the village area sewer extension project and related improvements and increases the appropriation to $16,100,000 and the bonds and notes authorized to $15,525,000. Okay, uh, Dave, I know you passed uh, information out last time. Do you want to go yeah, over uh, this in yeah. detail? Okay. Um, the, the material that was sent out uh, with the agenda is uh, what we call an ordinance spec sheet. It has all the uh, vital statistics 
uh, the total amount being authorized, the amount of debt being authorized. This is an amendment to the ordinance that we did in 2010, so that as you read through, uh, there are really two sets of numbers. The original numbers, uh, the original ordinance was for 12 million. We've now increased the total appropriation to 16.1 million. Um, we've increased the amount to be assessed only by uh, the number of properties, uh, which is uh, eight residential, one school, two commercial. Um, and also on our agenda is an agreement with the school that will uh, you know, identify exactly the amount that they're going to pay. So that's a, a separate issue. Um, so you know, all the facts and figures are really on that one, one page spec sheet. You were provided with the actual text of the ordinance tonight. Um, the one question that came up at the last meeting was regarding, you know, what is the difference between changing the level of assessment and the, you know, I wouldn't say it was a proposal, but a, you know, going from $12,000 to $14,000 as an average assessment um, would change the sewer rate by less than $20. It works out to about $19 and change. Or, or do you per quarter or per year. Change the sewer rate for what? If you were to, was, it, it, Currently, when, when we are sixty-six dollars and fifty cents. Yes, yeah, so is that twenty per quarter so now, or per year? No, twenty per year. Per year. So twenty per year divided by four is five dollars. Right. If you were to, it actually goes the other way. Oh, it's if you were less cheaper. If you were to assess, at a, on a basis of an average of fourteen thousand dollars per home. Right. Mm -hmm. It would potentially reduce the sewer rate by nineteen dollars and fifty cents. So for every twenty dollars for the year. So it would go down. Is what you're because saying. Of the if, you, if you assess more, right. you, you would be charging the sewer customers less. Right. Right. So that I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's, that's not. Gonna that's provided they all come on board at the same that. time, which they won't. And that's not going to happen for a, a, mm. at least four or five years, right? Mm. Well, it there's a, a couple different numbers that come into that equation. Um, as people connect, they're paying connection fees. Once the assessments are levied, you then have the additional assessments, and yeah. So how long did we, the, the assessments last time? Three, four, five, six years? Several years. And the and the the numbers I use in round numbers on the on the rate study, the rate calculation, is two years after the project completion is when you start collecting assessments. So it's two year project, two years after that you start having assessment revenue. Four years out. Four years out. So you see nothing happening to the sewer rate between then and now? Yeah. Uh, no, the, the, we'll be able to maintain a stable sewer rate because of the assessments that we did. We have assessment money coming in mm -hmm. that we can apply to the debt service. Okay. And you know we'll be able to manage that over the next couple of years as we start start paying additional debt service for the project that we're about to do. You know, obviously that debt service is going to increase over the next two years, mm -hmm. at some point we're going to issue bonds mm -hmm. and, you know, we'll start paying the bonds back. Within a year or two of issuing the bonds, we'll then have the assessment revenue coming back. But you don't see no spike and then or anything like that? No, we'll be able to manage that through mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. assessments that we're currently collecting. We'll have, to, we'll have to use them sparingly in this year and next year so that we have sufficient yeah. funds to cover the debt service payments as they increase in uh, 16 and 17, but it, it it's completely manageable with the, the revenue stream that we have. Okay. Without spiking on the rates. Okay. And by the time this affects each property owner, it'll be, we're talking like four years out? About? Four years from now, 2018. Well, uh, construction period of 18 months, we're going to start in April. So, uh -huh. you know, connections starting in 2016. Uh -huh. Um, currently, we require connections within two years. We had discussed maybe looking at that, and you know, over the course of 2014, we're going to have to do that so that people have sufficient time. If we change that and, and extend it a little bit, so you've got a three-year window from 16, 17, 18 that people are going to be connecting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sometime in 2017, 18, you're going to levy assessments, and you'll start collecting that revenue. That's my only concern is that these residents you know, some of them are still recovering from Hurricane Irene, and you know, I just want to make sure that 
they know what's coming. We talked well, about having that informational about meeting. Being transparent on this. Right. We want to have the informational yeah. meetings. We want to let them know what we're thinking, timing, you know, all that type we, of stuff. We learned so, our lesson from yes. the last two assessments yeah. that we had to deal with. You know, and and and, and I am I sensitive mean, to people. Very these sensitive. people. Super sensitive. You know, especially the people that were affected with the. Now, anybody flooding. wants to sell between now right. and that happens, they're going to be assessed. Well, actually, and they're going to have a lien against their um, home. With the exception of the 11 properties that we're adding tonight, mm -hmm. anyone who has sold since 2010, they already has, got that. As part of their tax search, knows that there is a pending assessment, and the tax office knows that the $12,000 number that we used as the basis. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, whether it be an attorney or you know, a third party <coughs> search firm calls, um, they know that there's a pending assessment and they're given the number of $12,000. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, I, I know I've talked to some residents that swear they hadn't heard anything like prior to, but you're saying they should have known since 2010. Well, if they have sold, it came up in a, tech, they, in a tech search. Right, but Melissa, a lot of people right. don't follow that's as true. closely as, as we do. We Until do. it really happens. Until, Until it really happens. happens. Yeah. I think yeah. that that's we, my concern. This particular time, we want to go out of our way to make sure yeah, that's residents my are aware so that we don't have to go through the assessment uh, nightmare. difficulties, <laughs> nightmare, however you want to refer to it, that we inherited. Yeah. So. No, I, I totally agree. And look, I agree with you totally that I want to be transparent. I want the information to be out there, even if we have to do an informational session um, session yeah. with these people. And what people. happens, Dave, with uh, people, you know, there's a lot of elderly people out there, seniors who, they don't really have anybody because we found them during the flood. Right. Is there any kind of programs or grants or anything to help those kinds the, of people? There is. The, the sewer assessment, yeah. um, you know, so long as the program continues, and it's been around for a long time, the, the County Community Development Program has a program to help mm -hmm. um, income qualified people. Okay. Um, and it's uh, depending on the amount, it's either a five or ten year loan that becomes an outright grant as long as you stay in the house Six. for the five or ten year period. Because mm -hmm. um, we're going to have to make many, sure that we lay that out. Many of our residents have yeah, taken yeah, advantage yeah, of yeah. that for sewer assessments. Mm -hmm. yeah. It has been used, so right. it is available. Okay. We just have to make sure they know, know about it. Right. Thank you. Yeah, the right mm -hmm. people need it's to know about two, that. It's about $2,000, isn't it? I, I don't know. It's, it's, Approximately about two thousand dollars. That's not well, nearly that, enough. That, that's a connection fee. Uh, yeah, that's there, what they cover. That's the part they cover. There are. It it will also cover the assessment, mm -hmm. the the cost of the construction. I, I know that the residents about the 12, have used it for the assessment. What's that? You're referring to the twelve fourteen thousand? Yes. So when we have oh, our okay. informational meetings, we'll have to make sure that information is available for people. Yeah, we'll have to get so that because they help each other out there. You know, they mm -hmm. help their neighbors and they, you know they, mm -hmm. they shovel their driveways. They do all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we do have to make sure they know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll have to get the information so they can follow up on that. We can do that. All right, great. Um, any other comments from council members? Jay, anything? No. I'm good. Alright, is there a motion to introduce this ordinance? I'll make a motion to introduce 2014-02. I'll second. Okay, roll call. Mr. Cole? Yes. Mr. Phelan? Yes. Mr. Vanderhoff? Yes. Ms. Winterfield? Yes. Mayor Florence Lynch? Yes. Alright, next on the agenda is uh, Item 10, resolutions for approval. Uh, Mr. Delaney, will you please read uh, each resolution by title? Uh, resolution R2014-51, authorizing tax office refunds over payments or cancellations. R2014-52, authorizing release of designated escrow deposits. R2014-53, authorizing execution of a contract for supplemental property acquisition services with the Land Conservancy of New Jersey. R2014-54, authorizing the Municipal Alliance grant application for fiscal year 2015. R2014-55, appointing a member to the Open Space Advisory Committee. R2014-56, appointing a member to the Economic Development Advisory Committee. 2014-57, authorizing an interlocal agreement with the Borough of Kinelon for QPA services. R2014-58, authorizing an interlocal agreement with the Borough of Bloomingdale for QPA services. R2014-59, authorizing the agreement with the Quantic Township Board of Education 
for the construction of a sewer line to service the Pawnee Valley School. R2014-60, approving the festivals, carnivals, exhibition, and show application for the Apple Chase 5K, 10K run. And R2014-61, approving the payment of itemized claims is set forth on the February 7th, 2014 bill list. And that bill list was a revised bill list with uh, one addition which has been uh, noted. Okay. Um, any comments on any of the resolutions from any council members? Uh, Jay, do you have anything on any, any of the resolutions? Just a question on the escrow account state. How long do we need to keep them? Mm -hmm. um, well, they they don't expire. They they stay on indefinitely, and that's uh, one of our um, uh, management improvement projects over the course of the past year has been to uh, improve our process. And we're actually we're pretty good with all of the current escrow accounts. Um, but there are a lot of old ones that just never got cleared out. I was out. just seeing one name on it. The one hasn't, hasn't been around a long time. Been yeah, uh, the, the thing with escrow is that, you know, we hold that money in trust. It's not the township's money. It belongs to, you know, the escrow holder. And at some point, if we're unable to locate them, uh, it becomes unclaimed property and has to be turned over to the state, uh, which in itself is a process. process. So. Um, We've done a lot of work in the past couple months to kind of make this process work but better. The newer ones are. Yeah, and now we're starting to go through the old ones and you know write some letters and try and find if people are still out there or not. And slowly we'll clear them, but you're going to be seeing these <coughs> on a regular basis over the next six months. That's it, Jay. That's it. Uh, Rich? I hope the snow's gone by the time the apple chase. <laughs> <laughs> That's March 30th. That's not that far away, guys. Hey, I remember having uh, snow on Easter mm -hmm. and whatnot, right? Wow. Um, nothing else? Oh. Right. Uh, Baron, I just should mention yeah. regarding the apple chase, uh, um, as you know, we've uh, had difficulty at times with various, with this process. Uh, I should note that uh, we do not have the authorization from the Board of Education, but that's pending. Uh, it's one of those. Uh, They're waiting for us, and we're waiting for exactly. them. Exactly. Right. Got it. Uh, catch you one first, right. You go first. No, you go first. <laughs> Kathy, you have anything? Well, I have a question on the Apple Chase. You know, these things are always um, delayed. They're already advertising it. We have at least maybe only at least twelve people from Pompton, uh, or Pequonic and Pompton Plains, who are participating in it. Usually, it's only about five or six. I see it was stamped received February 6th. I don't know. They dated it January 14th. I don't know what the holdup is, but they're already advertising before it's approved. It's already signing up people before it's approved. They just assume that we're going to rubber stamp this stuff. And we had the same conversation. We always year. have this conversation. Yeah. But I think the apple chase has been... It's one of the regular right. ones. I know it's one of the regular <laughs> ones. I know, but still. No, I agree with you. It would be nice if we approved it before they advertised it, but... Yeah. By ordinance, I think it's how many days, Dave? 45, 45 days, I think. 45 days. So they can start advertising before they submit anything. They would just have to pull it. They well, they're asking to hang signs. They already hung the sign before they even get the approvals. They already got the signs up by the tennis courts and everything. Well, that's on that's board of ed property. Yeah, right. Dave, what do you think? They're just. I mean, I'm just late. saying it. And, and just, you know, it's just right. this again. It's like whatever we say really doesn't mean anything. Well, then vote no. You right know. Here. Right. We, we made a comment. Okay. <laughs> so, you know. Obviously, if they're doing anything before they have approval, they're doing it at their own risk. That's right. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, no. Yeah. You know, I don't know how you compel someone to make application before they take any other steps. Well, do we sure. say anything, Jay, when we ha when they come in late? Do we at least kind of try to educate them for the next year? Well, That's they're not late. Probably. Frankly, this is, uh, this we're is not going to get them in. We have enough trouble getting them in by the 45-day deadline. Yeah, right. right. Well, this is early. Yeah. This is early, yeah. It is. Okay. But it really, you know, we say we do it every year. It's not really, doesn't really serve Pequonic. You know, majority of the runners are not Pequonic. It, they just happen to use our facilities, and they make money off of it. So the least they could do, force yeah, the least they could do is, yeah, could do is give us the courtesy of doing things in the way that they're meant to be. That's all. That's all I have to say. And on the um, the the QPA services, Dave, if you could just go through that a little bit, it's interesting. I'm wondering how that's going to work on a day-to-day -day operation. Um, well, the the benefit of having you know QPA qualified person yeah, is one, that, of, yeah. one of the items that is. Um, you know, there is a state designation, there's a series of courses and a test, and there's a benefit to having a QPA. Um, it permits you to increase your bid threshold. Um, 
uh, and handle a lot more of the routine purchases administratively without having to go through an extended and protracted you know, formal bid process. Well, that's good. How much does it raise it? Um, significantly. Without a QPA, it's 18? 17.5. 17.5. With, it can be as high as 36. That's great. Holly's are. Holly's are. Mm -hmm. uh, Holly is our QPA, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay also holds the designation as QPA, so we're fortunate to have a couple people on staff who who have the, the designation. A lot of communities don't have. And that's a certification they get? Yeah, it's yeah. a uh, series of courses and a state exam. That's good. Uh, it is, like I said, it's not required. Uh, this, you know, the state doesn't like to do that because of the state mandate, state pay kind of thing. Um, but there's an absolute benefit to having it. And it just happens that the, uh, the financial professionals in these three communities, you know, we've worked together and known each other a very long time. We help each other out on a regular basis mm -hmm. anyway. Um, so this is, you know, a discussion that actually came up over a year ago um, and we're putting it in place. My hope is that it leads to other opportunities for shared administrative things, services. So we're not going to do all their purchasing, but when they need to, no, no, they no. will? It's, there's only very specific uh, between that threshold of the 17.5 and the 36, mm -hmm. if as long as you have the designation, you're now allowed to make a purchase um, without formal bidding, you, okay. with, through quotation, through you know a, a quotation process. So um, Holly will be available to them to consult mm -hmm. and kind of go over the process. It, as you know, the part of the reason that this will work is because the finance professionals in those two communities. Um, you know, we have a good working relationship. They are, they know what needs to get done. What is so the documentation that documents that they consulted with her and all that? What how does that happen? Um, the, most of it will be by email. Okay. So that they've yeah you know, they've got a record of okay. her having reviewed you know the, the materials and uh, there's probably only a couple purchases a month mm -hmm. where she's going to be involved. Okay. Like, if you consider the number of bids that we actually do, uh, she'll be involved in a uh, bid review from time to time, and she, she'll be avail available by phone to consult okay. what they need. Hey, the more we can do things yeah, like this, the better. Great. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Like you said, it leads to other things. Yes. Uh, Dave, That's it. you have anything? Dave, just explain what exactly is the school going to get from us for the 114000 Are we just going to bring the sewer connection onto their property and then they're going to they get a sewer line <laughs> um, are we going to bring it all the way to the, to the building for the 140 we're not going to make the connection but the sewer line ends up with um, and I, I can show you the plans if you want and their uh, septic field is, in, the is in it's in the front of the building in the left hand corner kind of in front of the flagpole okay mm -hmm. the sewer line will be extended almost to Right outside the, the septic field. So all, so, they'll, have so all they'll have to do is collapse the tanks and, and connect in. Okay. Um, out the back of Leland. Yeah, up uh, from Leland, it'll come up the side road mm -hmm. and then across the front. It's a few hundred feet. Are we going to try to so not do construction like the first day of school, like we had? We'll <laughs> Let's make wait. sure we don't do that. And we're going to wait for the parade. Yeah, right. right. We're going to wait for the parade before we break ground out there. Okay? Don't worry about it. <laughs> I don't want to read about it. <laughs> I'm good on everything else. You're good on everything else. Um, I just want to make a comment as well, Dave. I uh, applaud you for uh, putting in those QPA services. Like you said, I think it's going to lead to other things. So it's a, a step in the right direction. Um, for shared services. Um, any, uh, let's see, if there's uh, no objections from the council to adopt these uh, resolutions, um, any objections? I'll okay. make a motion to approve motion? these resolutions. Yeah. Questions. 2014-51 through 2014-61. I'm sorry, there's a hand raised out here. Uh, oh, oh, oh. Yes. Just ask a question about one of these. Yeah. The open space one? Is there a reason he can't ask now? No. <laughs> he has a motion now, but I didn't see your hand. I know you have a motion, but uh, this uh, for the uh, member, are we only uh, doing one member? I, I didn't look at the book, I'm sorry. But, well, I'm sorry, which one are you talking about? The uh, 55. All that is, it was something we missed at the rework meeting. It is the liaison from the Environmental Commission to Open Space, I believe. Right. But we also have one from Parks and Rec, and we also have one from 
uh, historical too. Do they have to be appointed again? To, that that this that was my question. They they were done at the reorg. They were done at the reorg me meeting. This was one ready? that was missed. Okay, just making sure everybody's covered. Okay, yep. stay on top of it, Frank. All right. So Rich made a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Roll call, Jenny. Mr. Cole. Yes. Mr. Phelan. Yes. Mr. Vanderhoff. Yes. Ms. Winterfield. Yes. Mayor Florence Lynch. Yes. All right. Next on the agenda is uh, items for discussion. And once again, I see. I don't know if this was supposed to be on again. Um, the uh, draft committee it was, but uh, we had time. some issue with uh, <laughs> tracking down the original resolution. It got lost in the. Uh, 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 in the internet or something, but uh, we're, we're it's still in the cloud. It's in the cloud. <laughs> uh, but we will have that for you. Uh, uh, I, so, uh, can I make? Can yes. I ask if we can have a, this, a real quick discussion on something? And sure. My discussion is with the attorney and Dave um, fire hydrants. I happen yes. to be driving down West Parkway on Saturday, and I noticed one of our fire officials with a coal shovel and a DPW guy digging out fire hydrants. So, if we mm -hmm. make it. If there's an ordinance that says you have to shovel your sidewalks, doesn't it make sense to make sure people do the same thing for their fire hydrants? Yes, and actually that's supported by state law. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the, the two sides of that yeah, are the, we can do that and we can go enforce it and we can write tickets to people who have fire hydrants on their property um, who don't shovel it. Um, and under the current circumstances where we had these multiple storms and then a deep freeze, and I, I know that I have trouble manually clearing what's left off my driveway. I'm not sure that you, you want to go to Grandma and write her summons because she didn't oh, go out. Well, I'm not sure that I want to go and write Grandma summons because she can't shovel out. So we're going to send a fire, fire official out on a Saturday with a coal shovel and the DPW guy to dig out fire hydrants. As a matter of public safety, yes. Okay. So there is a state law that says hydrants must be clean. Yes. Incidentally, the house I'm buying has a hydrant right in the front. Mm -hmm. And I told Denise, your responsibility is to make sure that <laughs> And, and just so you understand some you know past practice, uh, again, under normal conditions, you have a, a deep snowstorm that blocks fire hydrants. Uh, normally on the, the Sunday after that, the fire department would go out and do right. what we call primary hydrants, right. ones along the main streets, the turnpike, the boulevard, sunset. So that you've always got a hydrant within 1,000 feet rather than every 500 feet. Um, again, because of the deep freeze and the icing conditions, they, they just weren't able to do that. Um, so it, while this is not unprecedented, we've done it a couple times in the past, uh, it was a conscious decision on our part to you know, maintain public safety and have hydrants okay, available I, I, I don't in certain locations. The safety part. It's just what no, is I the, understand. What is, the, and what is the, the public's responsibility in helping out with this yes. situation? Because the, you know, there is a responsibility there, and you know, we try and balance right. I, what's I read on reasonable. our website, adopt a hydrant, right. like adopt a hydrant. Yeah. And a lot of people do. And, you know, a lot of people do. A lot of people do, and a lot of people don't. How about help a neighbor, you know? Exactly. Dave and I had a couple of conversations on this. I think he was even going to report on it. But, um, yeah, it's just with the snow that we had this time and then the deep freeze, you know, there were, you never, everybody, you know, my phone rang a couple of times. You know, you try to tell people, you know, you need to shovel your sidewalks, and then they complain that the DPW trucks throw the ice back on there. I saw it it's like, Facebook. right, mm -hmm. and you know, so you have to, you have to take safety serious first. You have to keep everybody safe. So they're they're doing a great job. The bottom line is Denise is adopting a hydrant by the new house. Thank you very much. <laughs> she doesn't know it. <laughs> We'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get some pictures to see who's doing it. So um, we got next on the agenda is what reports and notices. Uh, do we need to go through that? Res uh, there was a resolution of the Township of Washington regarding supporting establishment of a water tax bill. That was the uh, report and notice. Does anybody have any comments on that? No? Okay. Um, next is the manager's report. Uh, Dave, do you want to go through your report? Certainly. Uh, an updated project status report has been distributed this evening. That is the, the two page. Highlights include the following projects have been completed installation of bollards at Engine Company 2, installation of generators at wells number 1 and 2, 
and implementation, implementation of our hosted telephone system are all complete at this time. The bids have been advertised for the Boulevard Sidewalk Project, and final design is almost complete for the Jefferson Street Project. Uh, budget work sessions have been advertised, or will be advertised, for February 20, 27, and March 3rd. Those are Thursdays. They seem to work out best for everyone. Uh, budget workbooks will be distributed by the end of this week. Uh, my apologies for not having them on Friday. Uh, other things like snow. Well, March 3rd is a Monday, right? Uh, no, it should be a Thursday. No. Okay. March 3rd is a Monday. What is it? I thought it was Thursday. Hold on. The first is on the Saturday. It's on a Saturday? <laughs> the first is on the Saturday. Well, it's on March 3rd. It says on here, though. Is it, you say, is it March 6th instead Monday. of 3rd? Monday. All right, sorry. It's supposed to be the 6th then. Okay. The 6th. March 6th. Put 20, whatever. The 6th. It was three, three consecutive Thursdays. Uh, this winter has provided many challenges for our DPW in maintaining safe roads. All residents are asked to assist in clearing snow from around fire hydrants. As snow continues to accumulate and travel widths on our streets become narrower, every effort is made to keep our streets safe, including uh, sight distances at intersections. It's very important that snow not be pushed back into the street during or after municipal plow operations. This is also um, uh, regulated by ordinance. It is not permitted for residents or businesses, snow plow operations, uh, to push snow back into the street after we have plowed. Uh, it's not something that we enforce rigorously, and for most snows, it really, it's not a big deal. Uh, um, it just gets pushed to the side. It's going to become a big deal because all the material on the side of the road now is frozen solid. It is rock hard. Mm -hmm. An additional snowstorm that, you know, may be coming. That snow has nowhere to go except up and over, and it's going to continue to narrow the width of our roads. We are going to start enforcing, seriously, pushing snow back onto roads. So. Um, you know, people who snow blow, plow operators who are pushing it out to the road, uh, just be warned, don't do it. I have a question also about the sidewalks. Are the sidewalks supposed to be the width of the sidewalk or just this little narrow path that goes down? <laughs> uh, <laughs> because some of the sidewalks are like the very narrow, the narrow, um, narrow um, that you have to walk single file. Hey, as long as they're passable, we, they're done. we consider them done. Yeah. If no effort's been made, or I mean, it hasn't been done in a storm or two, that's when we, okay. uh, you, you know, door and hanger notices and then uh, summonses. Okay. And I would hope if anybody has elderly neighbors that they're out there helping them. Let's hope. Some yes, some no. That's your report? Okay. Um, let's go to the council uh, reports. Council members, uh, let's see, we'll start with, I'll go on this side now, Dave. Uh, Parks and Rec had to change their meeting from Monday, uh, February 3rd to Tuesday the 4th. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend that because I had an umpire's meeting that I had to attend. Uh, there are some things that are coming up. Uh, Spring Fling uh, is going to be Saturday, April 26th. Uh, the 43rd annual trout fishing contest will be on April 5th. And the townwide garage sale will be on the um, May 17th and August 23rd. There's a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, the farmers market is moved back to behind town hall again because uh -huh. I guess they were originally getting, they were thinking about moving it to PV Park, and with the sewer project, that's going to be a problem. So they're they're moving it back to, uh, to town behind town hall here. Uh, open space met last night. And they talked about the uh, easements, and everyone is in agreement with the easement that Frank uh, brought to us at the last council meeting. And that's all I have. Okay. And Dave, they are. Park, uh, DPW doing a great job, and I was glad to see that they started removing the snow from the business community down in, in this area. And oh, yeah. I'm sure everyone is greatly appreciated for everything we've done. Uh, thank you. That's all. Uh, I really don't have anything. Uh, my commission did a wonderful job out there. Uh, I have an extra copy of this. I don't know if you want to share it with Steve. So maybe you need some material for the paper. <laughs> for friends of the Martinberry House, there's an extra copy. Somebody wants to give it? You got it? Okay, good, because it would be nice to see a little write up there. He actually wrote the article for him. Something really nice to write. Okay. Um, 
And Ed, if you can think about the, the field trip for council to the house. That's but we have to go at separate times. We can't that's one of I'm sure we can figure it out. Okay. I've already been, so, you know. We'll make it a social gathering. There you go. <laughs> Cookies and a compass and all that stuff. That's exactly what I didn't say that. You guys said that. <laughs> okay, Rich, you got anything? Uh, just that the first day squad is going to be looking to purchase a new ambulance next year. Uh, mm -hmm. Their current 5.7 five, uh, five, is starting to fall apart as they sink more mm -hmm. mm -hmm. money. Could you say that again, Dave? The woman in the back wants to hear a little bit better. They don't need an ambulance. Oh, I can see you see that. They already got a new one. That was the rescue. They don't think we need it. Okay. Is there one? Is it sleigh riding or is it like bobsled near the... <laughs> it's ice, yeah. Yeah, really. It's like all ice. There, 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 the luge. Have kids been there lately? Yeah, they're there. It's probably a okay. good year. Uh, about six years ago, we passed a tree, a Christmas tree ordinance. And then we had, about uh, four years ago or three years ago, some people come in and cried. And mm -hmm. It was changed. Now, I'm sure that gentleman's not around anymore. But if you want down the turnpike, it's a little past the Christmas tree market. And all the spirit has everything still out there. I do have to make a comment on that because I had mentioned that because um, I had noticed that. But then I did talk to Sister Marie. They have been trying to get it the down, been bad. but it's they can't get it out. And I said to her, "Do you, do you need? Do you have a crew?" She goes, "Oh no, we have the people to take it out." Christmas and New Year's. But she's she's saying that the ground was just rock solid and they couldn't get the stuff out of there. But they are working on it. They got You're down right everything. Right there. Well, I'm just saying. And I just saw uh, her on. I just saw her on Saturday night. <laughs> Friday. Night. And she told me that they're working on it. Yeah, that I saw there too, and I told her. I mean, that, that's the reason the ordinance was passed. And yeah. It wasn't anything to do with church. No. Oh, we had a commercial establishment that prompted it. And now it has gone the other way. The commercial people cleaned up one, two, three, mm -hmm. and the church has the stuff out there. And they, there was a window, I believe, opportunity. So, Enough. I want to mention it. I don't have yeah. to find uh, what else we can do. I mentioned it to her. And I poor Dave, I think, you know, so forcing the snow <laughs> off the street is a. Uh, Something that's going to have to be done, uh, especially if people do it late. The roads are clean. Now you create a dangerous ice. Yeah, spot. especially it, when it's been so freezing. And again, when it's you know, warm and sunny, the stuff melts, but it, it's just not melting, and it becomes hard pack and, and ice. I see. Can allow us, I guess, putting an ordinance into it. Back. So. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, planning board is going to discuss the sign ordinance and rezoning in the March meeting. Uh, fire department had an officers meeting. Uh, everything went well. I believe all the officers are on the same page for this year. Uh, company two has a meeting Thursday night, and company one meeting this Friday night, and everything's good with the company one. And uh, I think that's it. Thanks, Jay. All right, I don't have any committee reports this month, but I do have a few announcements. Um, there was going to be an adult program at the library this Thursday, and it's postponed due to the weather. The reason I bring it up is um, there was a lot of uh, hype around it, so we, they expected a good turnout. Um, there was an author of a well-known book, uh, Rita Gianti, who was going to run this program. She had written a book called The Godfather's Daughter, A Mafia Childhood. Um, and but there was a, they expected a good turnout because there was a feature article of the of the story in the Star Ledger. There was one coming out, I believe, tomorrow in the Trends, and it was also on the front page of the Daily Record. But they will be um, postponing that due to the snow. Um, we don't have a new date yet. Uh, the Knights of Columbus is sponsoring a, sponsoring a community blood drive on Sunday, February 23rd. It will be held at Good Council Church, um, you know, run by the Community Blood Services, um, and it's from 8 a.m. to 1.30. Um, this, and real quick, I just want to mention this again. I mentioned it last time. Suburban Women's Club is holding their annual tricky tray and dinner on March 2nd at the Best Western Regency House, and the tickets are on sale now. Uh, Deborah Hospital Foundation 
um, they are hosting a pizza party, um, an open house mixer and social event right here at our senior house. Um, and everyone's welcome and invited to celebrate Heart Awareness Month and to find out more about uh, the life-saving work of Deborah Heart and Lung Foundation. That's February 27th at 7 p.m. And then don't forget, on Sunday, April 5th, the township will be uh, sponsoring their annual River Cleanup Day. Uh, letters did go out to business, businesses and organizations that have helped in the past. We're always looking for volunteers to come out that day, and I know all of you are working on that, but if you know someone in a local organization, um, that will uh, help on that day. Please contact the clerk's office for more information. We'd really appreciate it. And that's all I have. Well, so what was the, the tricky track? That is... The 12th, I think. The do I have the wrong date? March 12th. 12th, okay. You said the second. That's the Sunday. Yeah, no, March 12th. Okay. Okay. Um, and um, next on the agenda, we're going to go into public comment. Um, if anyone wishes to address the council... Please wait to be recognized and come to the microphone and provide your name and address for the record. Anyone from the public want to come up? Good evening, Council. Sharon sure. Taylor, 19 Libby Avenue, Pompton Plains, section of Aquatic Township. <laughs> I just wanted to bridge on um, and comment that the DPW has done a phenomenal job with maintaining our roads. And um, I think it was back in 2012, there was discussion, and that's where you adopted the contract with Morris County mm -hmm. to maintain the main roads that are considered county. They've done such a good job, and I just wanted you to clarify, is it still going well, David, or? Yeah, it's uh, going very well for us. Um, there were a couple of hiccups last year because the the county also hires uh, third-party private contractors um, as part of their regular operations, um, and uh, our coordination with that third party last year uh, was a little difficult. And this year, you know, we basically told the county that we we didn't need that additional support, so we're doing it um, all ourselves. It is working out extremely well. Um, the guys do a great job. It actually, I, I believe it works out better for us locally because, you know, essentially 80% of our local municipal streets um, are attached to a county road. So, uh, you know, to coordinate that with our own guys works out much better. I think um, it's better too because nobody knows our streets better than our DPW. And keeping it in-house allows our township to get cleaned a lot quicker than if we relied on the county so if there was like an emergency or you know for traveling it, the roads do become a little bit safer um, I, how are we doing with the salt supply do we do we get that um, did, at the beginning of the season or well we, we we get a full load at the beginning of the season actually part of our contract with the county they do provide us with some um, there is a region-wide, not just New Jersey, but uh, northeast, eastern seaboard, region-wide shortage of salt uh, because of the, the difficult winter. No one in New Jersey, not the state, not the county, not any locals are currently receiving any salt. Um, this is a potential problem if we continue to experience bad weather. Um, our supply is adequate for now. Uh, we're okay at least through the next storm. Um, the state has reached out as uh, to other states as far away as Virginia and Maine to try and uh, relocate supplies, but with uh, no success so far. So, um, yeah, we we have always been fairly conservative with our salt use between the use of brine, um, and we don't have a lot of hills that we have to worry about. Uh, you're you're going to notice uh, that we're going to be a lot more lean with salt over the next couple weeks. Uh, in anticipation of not having an adequate supply so that it will be used extremely sparingly and only at you know intersections and on hills um, so we'll manage it and we'll make it last as long as we can but we like I said we are we have adequate supply for the next at least the next storm and probably the next two and it, how much like do we bring it in the begin we bring it in the beginning of the season like how much do you know or well we can store uh, several hundred tons um, we also supply salt to the Board of Education and to Children's Hospital. 
Um, yeah, they're, and they're very clean, Chilton Hospital. We've noted, uh, notified both of them that they need to be conserved with their use as well. And then does the township, um, maybe with the upcoming snowstorms, just, you know, um, reach out to the public to drive a little bit more safe, safely if we're kind of low on salt, you know, um, because, you know, I think, um, you know, there's always that concern. There's a lot of commuting within the township, you know, so if we're kind of running low on supply and, you know, the roads, especially the county type roads. Well, we hope that people drive safe yes. all the time. Uh, you know, and to the extent that we do, um, you know, weather bulletins, weather advisories, if we need to include that type of information, you know, the, the other uh, safety concern that we have, you know, now and going forward is uh, sight distances at intersections because the piles at the side of the roads tend to start getting uh, above three feet, which is, you know, about what, where drivers and cars sit when they're looking, you don't necessarily see drivers coming, so it's not just the ice on the road, it's the ability to see where you're going. So there's a lot of safety concerns and we'll continue to try and get that information out as necessary. And, and we're still getting reimbursed, was that $75? Um, yeah, we actually upped it a little bit and we've uh, we've billed the county so far this year, uh, not including the most recent storm, over $25,000. Okay. Um, more than covering our costs. And it covers benefits and, and the wear and tear on all the vehicles and overtime and all. I think they've done, DPW does a phenomenal job. They really do. They really keep this township nice. I'm, I'm very proud of them. You should drive from here into Wayne. Wayne yes. is a it is. Well, I used to work in Wayne, so it's, um, Ratsa Road was never a pleasure, and there's no way to get home, so it's, you know, but going up that hill, forget it, and take a different route, the long route. Mm -hmm. But they do, they do a phenomenal job. And then just another comment about the fire hydrants. I think a, a lot of the, a big problem too is, especially on my street at the corner, um, the fire hydrant was okay, but then when the plows start pushing all the snow up, I've got about, I mean, I don't have a fire hydrant in front of my house, but I've got four foot, four and a half foot of solid ice in front of that fire hydrant. So even if I wanted to go and try to shovel it, you can't even get a shovel through it. So I think it was just under circumstances that, uh, you know, it's just hard to get, get a hold of. So hopefully this next storm <laughs> won't be as bad. But uh, good job to DPW. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Have a good evening. Okay. Anyone else? Was it a nicely loose hand up or something like I that? I did. I had similar comments to what Sharon had to say. Did I cover it all? You covered it all? Thank you very much. Good job. Good report. All right. Um, I think that's it then. Um, the next item on our agenda is closed session. So at this time, we'll be going into uh, executive se session. Um, am I supposed to say what it's in regards to? Discuss two matters of litigation. Right. Okay, two tax appeals. And uh, is there a motion to I'll go in? I'll make a motion to go in and second. Seconds, please. Sorry.